Hi, everybody. Today is Tuesday, September 21st. You are at the Kubernetes SIG testing biweekly meeting. I'm your host, Aaron Krickenberger, aka Aaron of SIGBeard, aka SPIFXP, at all the places. Um, this meeting is being recorded and will be posted publicly to YouTube later, where you can all watch yourselves adhere to the Kubernetes code of conduct by basically being your very best selves to each other. Uh, on today's agenda, we've got a couple things to discuss. I'd love to give as much time to others, uh, other folks items before, uh, if there is time left over, I'll go over sort of where we are with our uh, items that we have proposed for the 123 uh, release cycle. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Chow to talk about Prow supporting Google Cloud Build as a runtime. Chow, I'm most likely, I'm going to make you a co-host in case you want to share your screen. Yeah, sure, please. Cool. Now I can present. Good. Yeah, we can see that. Interesting. I didn't know why I can't see it, but anyways, uh, so hi everyone. Good morning if you're on West Coast. I'm not sure which time zone we're on. Uh, so this is Chow from Google. Uh, I've been working on Prowl for who knows how long, I kind of forgot. So today I want to uh, present an idea that our team is interested in promoting. Uh, which is uh, supporting a Google Cloud build runtime in Prowl. I'm not expecting this. <laughs> yeah, that's long enough. Not long enough. I, I can keep working on this. It's a fun project, to be honest. Uh, so basically, uh, I I'm not expecting this idea to be controversial or breaking to any of the existing Prowl functionality. It's more like a uh, opt-in feature that a user can uh, schedule a Google Cloud build from Prowl without wrapping around with a batch script of monitoring a Google Cloud build. This is pretty much the idea. So. Uh, we have two basic reasonings behind this. Uh, so first of all, uh, we, as a Google Pro uh, maintainer or operator, we manage a, pro, a couple of Pro instances for other teams. And uh, due to security concerns, we have been highly recommending each team to maintain their own GKE build cluster for Pro, uh, which uh, has turned out to be a toil for smaller scale teams. Well, uh, especially the ones who are not super familiar with Kubernetes. Uh, and we do have users like that. So uh, the first purpose of this proposal is uh, we want to be able to support them uh, without the toy of maintaining a GKE cluster or any Kubernetes cluster. Uh, the other thing we would like to uh, make simpler is uh, the security concern. So we have seen quite a few teams use Docker and Docker to do Docker operations, which is a security concern in proud jobs, especially uh, the internal uh, each company's private or whatever they want to keep secure uh, it's actually anti-pattern -pat so uh, we would like to promote google cloud build for these scenarios instead of using docker in docker um, so the basic idea is uh, we want to extend project to include a, another agent types so uh, if you are not already familiar with the current most popular runtime of Prowl is Kubernetes. The agent type is Kubernetes. 
and uh, uh, we will create a new agent type called Cloud Build. And the uh, current spec in the Proud Jobs will be replaced by a Cloud Build spec, which will match Cloud Build's APIs. So, so basically, the idea is we will let users to embed a full fledged Cloud Build YAML definition into a Proud Job. And if they say this job is using Cloud Build Agent, then uh, Pro will be smart enough to schedule this cloud build onto uh, the cloud build project it specifies. So to do this, we'll also add a, a GCP project field into the uh, project definition, just like uh, how we define cluster in the project. And uh, uh, the trigger would be pretty much the same as the uh, all of the other projects. There will be no change. We will not use Google Cloud Build trigger because of the single source single source code limitation. Uh, just a slightly more context here: Google Cloud Build can only clone a single repo uh, as part of the triggering. So we will still use proud triggering. Like uh, for PRs, it will be through GitHub webhooks and for periodic, it will be just like the cron tab we have. And the, so by nature, we'll also support pops up to trigger Google Cloud build. And uh, due to other limitations, the, uh, the other limitation of Google Cloud Build, we will pretty much reuse all of the pro pod utilities, like uh, clone ref init upload and uh, uh, entry point, all of these uh, pod utilities that we invented for running Kubernetes pods, uh, they, I, I've done a POC, a proof of concept, and turned out to be they can just be used for a Google Cloud build out of box. So we will reuse this set of utilities for cloning source code, for uploading artifacts, for capturing exit code, et cetera, all of the stuff for the initial version of Google Cloud build. Um, I think this is pretty much what I want to cover here. Uh, does anyone have any concern or comments or would like to get involved as a reviewer? I forget where the raise hand functionality is in this map, uh, but I, <laughs> I have some questions. I think. Um, so as you may be aware, Kubernetes uses Google Cloud Build substantially right now in order to build Docker images so that we avoided that Docker and Docker security violation. Uh, we use a tool that lives in the testing for repo under the images builder directory called image builder. Um, and essentially that papers over a bunch of the uh, complexities of Cloud Build. Um, and I'm just sort of trying in my head to figure out what advantages this offers to us over that existing utility? Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I can answer now. Do you, sorry, did I interrupt you? Well, I was going to say, near as I can tell, like what looks real obvious right away is I can embed my Cloud Build YAML inside of the job definition instead of having to do a two step thing where I have a Cloud Build YAML in some repo and then I have a job that is then going to take a look at that cloud build YAML. Uh, that's had its pros and cons. I kind of enjoy that people are able to update their cloud build YAMLs without having to go through test infra approvers. Um, the, uh, the other thing that it offers, which I don't, I don't see here, is the ability to trigger uh, multiple variants of a given uh, job. So the, uh, one of the great use cases is for the Kubekins image that 
runs about 1,800 jobs of the 2,400 that Kubernetes currently triggers. Um, and we build a variant of that for each release branch of Kubernetes because different branches of Kubernetes have different versions of Go and uh, some of the older ones have different versions of Bazel and stuff. So it's basically the same cloud build file, but then there's a variance file that describes the different environment variables to use, um, which has been a pretty handy function for that and a number of other images. Um, so it feels like we would lose that in favor of a bunch of copy pasted cloud build jobs, I think. Um, what have I missed? Yeah, I got you. Uh, so uh, you're absolutely right. I didn't mention this, but we did look into that utility. Uh, so uh, probably I forgot to mention the purpose of this, this design or uh, the end goal of the, this design does not include deprecating that cloud field utility. So I think they are two different paths. Uh, when we first started, we uh, Cole asked exactly the same question. Why can't we just use that? And the problem, not the problem. I, I think the, the thing is there are different purposes. So this design is we want to fully adopt or support Google Cloud Build as a runtime. So uh, including running tests, we will support running unit tests, run integration tests, everything, as long as you can run it on Google Cloud Build, we would collect artifacts and display results on, on Prowl natively. I think that's uh, the purpose of this design. Okay, I mean, <clears throat> personally, once there are two different ways to trigger a Google Cloud Build, I'd rather uh, resolve down to one. Um, and I think like copy pasting job configs can be done with a pattern I've seen a number of other people do where they generate job configs from something else. Uh, and so we can validate down yeah. configuration differences and then generate a bunch of different jobs. So then that brings me to my next question. I feel like this would not be usable for a project that is the size of Kubernetes because of the quota issues uh, that we run into with Google Cloud Build. Like I have a difficult time, uh, you, you mentioned 30, but it's it's actually unclear to me how a public customer can request that that quota gets raised to 30 because it's not accessible through the default quota interface. Um, so the default quota is uh, 10 concurrent builds per project. And then I think there's something else about queuing uh, ahead of that. And we've hit that a number of times. Uh, one of the use cases is if somebody changes something that changes a bunch of the E2E test images all at once in uh, the Kubernetes repo, we'll trigger more than 10 Google Cloud build jobs. And at the moment, we error out. So I'm assuming one of the things we would gain is Prowl would uh, be able to treat this much like it treats pods, you know, waiting for pods to schedule these, these uh, Google Cloud build backed proud jobs could go to pending, which would be great, but um, I don't see how we avoid having to have something like Boscos manage a pool of GCP projects that we could arbitrarily uh, trigger builds against and then have the configuration management to making sure Prow can trigger things appropriately. Yeah, uh, I, I can answer this question here. Uh, I, I don't think I've mentioned this limitation, but it's, it does exist in this doc. Uh, the 30 concurrent field limitation is on default public pool, which uh, is going to be what we recommend to the users who want to opt in this feature. And to be honest, I don't feel uh, like we are going to replace or swap all of the pro jobs to use this runtime. And I would still expect Kubernetes community to keep using Kubernetes cluster as their runtime or most of their, for majority of their jobs. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah, they, we could use image builder for this, but uh, if there are more than 30 images to be pushed at once, I would say, 
uh, we may want to think about a private pool or uh, in another way, uh, actually they can be pulled into a single Google Cloud build because they can run in parallel. And uh, I don't see a limitation on the VM size that you can choose. So um, if, for example, if you have 20 concurrent images building the same Google Cloud build, you can just request the uh, arbitrarily large virtual machine and you should be able to just build it concurrently. Okay. Those sound like decent workarounds. I guess I'm still just kind of poking at the, the design assumption that we should treat GCP projects equivalent to the cluster field where it's sort of a, a hard coded thing. I'm just wondering if you want to- Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, GCP project being something that is dynamically allocated from a Boscus instance. That's a good point. I. I haven't thought about that, but I can uh, keep that mind, uh, in mind while refining this design. That's a valid point. Okay. Uh, dynamic project is going to be an interesting, but I'm not sure how we can handle that with Boscos and Prowl. And I don't have a good answer now, uh, but we can uh, discuss later offline. Sure. Let me write it down. Uh, does anybody else have any questions for Chow? It sounds like you're not really targeting any uh, Kubernetes related crowd jobs uh, for this. There are no, there are no Kubernetes uh, subprojects that you're talking to who want this functionality. Is that right? Right, not in the short term. So our, to be honest, our primary targets are smaller projects at uh, different companies or especially at Google. If they want to use Pro, we want to give them an easier way to onboard instead of uh, they need to create build cluster, uh, service count, all of those stuff. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. If there are no other questions, uh, let's go over to Antonio. Ginkgo V2 on the agenda. Yeah, I I was experimenting with the the branch that Tonsi provided, and the good news is that uh, it works. With just I had to comment one. I, I think that the what is the name? There are some difference, but on the reporters, but I don't think that are biggest issues for us. And at least in Sync Network, we need one thing. They need to order the tests, you know, to, to be able to send tests to do, not run in parallel with others. And I think that the labels uh, feature is going to be nice so we can get rid of the tags in the, in the names and the rejects. But I don't think that, <laughs> that we can implement, implement it without disrupting something. So, I think that this will need a, a cap. Uh, I mean, I, I'm happy to work on that, but uh, what I wanted to ask is, what is SIG testing position on this? And to answer is, uh, what is his uh, roadmap? When does he plan to have this stable or the, the B2 GA? Sure, I can, I can take the GA question if you'd like, just as a starting point. Uh, maybe just by way of apology to start. Uh, I spent many years pretty non-responsive to Ginkgo issues because I had an insane job. <laughs> it was super stressful, but I have a lot more time now. And so I've spent that time working on this V2 thing and really trying to take into account a lot of community feedback over the years and to try to like ship something that actually solves a lot of the pain points. Um, 
I know Ginkgo has a reputation of being, uh, anyway, it, it is what it is and I'm happy to, I'm happy to, to make it better. Um, uh, and I'm excited by the release. So uh, in terms of roadmap, I'm literally like today, I'm finishing the tests up on before all and after all, which is a big request within ordered context. Can I just run one setup and run one cleanup and run all my tests and not have to repeat the setup and cleanup. And that's, um, that's almost the last feature. I've got a couple of small things still to go and then just like clean up the docs. So long story short, I'm hoping by middle of October, um, it, it, I can just call it GA and ship it. I might have a release candidate in like the next couple of weeks um, and just give folks a chance to give me some feedback in, the, in a few weeks, but then I, I just wanna get it done. And it's pretty close at this point. Um, the branch, my intention is for that to be stable, Antonio. So like, if you want to start, like I'm, I'm not, I don't want to make, I'm, I don't think there'll be many major changes. So I, I don't think I'll, I'll break things, but I can appreciate not wanting to pull it in until it goes GA. Yeah, I would say that not pulling it in until it goes GA is kind of my, my stock answer. Um, I think so there's a question of timing here. Somebody who knows the release better than me. I know of code freeze happening hazily sometime by like mid-November. Does anybody remember what the date is? Well, but yeah, there's one thing. I don't know if anybody's going to work on that. If I'm going to work on that, I don't have time now. I'm just, you know, preparing okay. everybody to get feedback and maybe you say, well, we, we don't plan to do this in one month or during this year. So for sure, this is not for this release. I don't have time. Okay. That answers that question. Then, then having said that, I think, yes, it is interesting. Yes, it is the sort of thing. I think we could start drafting a cap on what the implications of this look like at pretty much any time. And mm -hmm. I'm going to be, you know, most interested in the, I don't know, the tech that we think this can help us remove. Um, you know, looking at it from a like, what's the least disruptive way we can introduce this? And then iteratively, how can we take advantage of the new features that Ginkgo offers? Um, I am super, super grateful that labels are in here. Uh, uh, Sorry, it took so long. To, to write. Um, I'm sure it took uh, a much longer time to implement. Um, the, the challenge is like, for better or for worse, I feel like our test names are kind of some sort of API at this point and, uh, and they consider are. the implications of how we deprecate those. Um, my first thought is just in the context of conformance because everybody has those hard-coded strings uh, laying around. Uh, but also like <clears throat> uh, one useful feature we have is since like sig the sig name is embedded in a, in a test name like sig network, right? The easiest way for us to figure out all the tests that SIG Network owns is by regular expression, but not just at the Ginkgo level, also like in how we display all of our test results on the test grid tool, it's got the ability to include and exclude uh, rows by regular expression on the name. Um, so I don't quite know how to reconcile that difference just yet. It could be that we decide there are tags like that that are still useful to include in the tests, but other tags like serial and uh, disruptive and conformance and stuff that are maybe uh, less important to include in the test name. Uh, so the policy stuff is kind of the biggest question mark for me. Um, I don't know what other stuff you had in mind in particular, Antonio, that you were like excited to try implementing to see if it could um, simplify our lives. Well, the, the, the labels and the, I mean, the, currently, if you have to add a new test or something, it's impossible. And and we have, I don't know how many tags. I, I spent one week just reorganizing all the tags in SIG network and, and having labels and this and the need for, for being able to run the serial with, with the parallel one. Because in SIG network, we, we, we have some tests that bind to ports and they cannot collide or, or will fail the, the test. And we need that because otherwise people are, has to end with 200 
rejects and it's periodic that everybody somebody comes to say my test is failing and just add the serial tag so <laughs> i just want to automate that problem but uh, what the other thing is that i know the people from what is this project that runs the conformance the oh boy yeah I, I wanted to know from them because they are the main stakeholders of the api of the e2a and and they should be involved because i don't know what what this represents to people that consumes this that's a fair point i it's been a while since i've looked at sauna boy's code base i don't know if anybody here qualifies as a maintainer of sauna boy but we can ask in the kate's conformance channel my impression last time i looked was they basically just use the the regular expressions like there are a couple environment variables that they use um and and then I think they have flags on there and that map to like what to set those environment variables. I don't think they actually expose the full environment variable. And so it ideally on their end would be as simple as translating, you know, eventually translating from regular expression to a set of labels. And if it's, it changes how we invoke things in parallel versus not, it would, you know, slightly change that. I think most of the heavy lifting is going to be on the Kubernetes side in terms of how we declare and categorize our tests. There's also technically that we publish the image that Sonobui consumes, which is also like a release artifact. And I know there are people just using the image. Um, like you can basically run the conformance tests without the tool Sonobui. Um, the tool actually doesn't do that much in the case of running conformance tests. It, yeah, it like schedules an image, polls, and then pulls some files back when the image is done. Yeah, so you can accomplish that um, and like say your air gap testing by just kind of like taking the release image, deploying your own manifest with the image, and then using like cube cuddle to pull and then like copy down the results. Um, and so that image has like the, the, what Sonobui is doing is setting environment variables to that image, but there are also non Sonobui things that are doing this. Uh, that we should at least consider. I don't really know what sort of stability contract we expect with that, but I'm sure we're going to break someone. No. <laughs> uh, this is, this is the fun thing. People use everything. Right, right, exactly. And like, who knows what the contract is, right? It just emerges. Um, just a couple of quick thoughts. One is um, the, the label stuff is obviously it's additive. So you can take your time migrating and just frankly, you're gonna just end up with a different kind of mess anyway, because that's that's the nature of tags and labels, right? And that, that's okay. It's sort of like pick the mess that you feel like you can best groom and handle and that, yeah. that's fine. Um, uh, and the, the other major thing is I, one of the main things I wanna try to do is like support the effort. And in particular, I, I wanna, I want to ask, is there a way to surface any like major blockers or deal breakers? Because the last thing I want to do is like go GA. And then a month later, V3 is GA <laughs> because I had to, you know, make a breaking change because we discovered something. And so Antonio, thank you for pulling the branch in and just seeing that, okay, like, you know, 90% level it's working. That's great. Um, I'd love to, to, to just ask that question of like, what is, what are some things we can do to, to suss out whether there are any deal breakers here. So next step is uh, I need to write down the cap and call okay. out the stakeholders. And and Benjamin and Aaron are going to help me to, to identify the, the I gaps. Mean, I definitely, sign, yeah, sign me up for that. Like I, the, the only other analogy I can think of is where like Jordan has had a draft PR out for a while uh, to like migrate Kubernetes, Kubernetes over to a fully module based system. Cause we thought Go117 was gonna yank the rug out from underneath of us on that. Yeah. So if you have something like that going for Inco V2, I think we could use, you know, we could like iterate on that and see the, the pre-submits uh, test against that. And that would hopefully uncover most of the any of the potential deal breakers, I think. And that could that's sort of scope out the, the actual cap. 
what, what, what do you mean? I mean, I have a PR with Kingo with his branch against Carbon Kubernetes. That's what I, I say. That's really all I was asking for. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Not that we merge it, but that like, yeah. like to, just to get the ball rolling, I think opening an issue that's a placeholder for a cap and then opening a cap that's, you know, mostly all the stuff that's got to do in it, but just like writing down, hey, there's an in-progress PR here and we're working okay, on it. Okay, that's, yeah, I can do that. We can that kind of merge that as provisional. I think in terms of surfacing things to unsee here, the the um, I think just the PR should help quite a bit cover like what Kubernetes itself is going to run into here. Um, I'm wondering if for everyone else, if we might be able to, with some abstraction on top that we use, and also like two reporters, maybe we could have it so that we start using labels to construct like sort of the legacy test names and have like the default reporter uh, continue including the full like super verbose test name with all the like tag regixable things in it and then have um, have some like opt-in to start using the labels instead. Yeah, I, I'm hoping we can, we can sort that out. Like, so we just like, there's no, there's no breaking change. It's just like, if you want to stop dealing with the, like the regex stuff, you can migrate to like, we also have that metadata. Yeah. Um, I feel, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong and tell you, I feel like kind of iterating on this is, is feasible in the time frame that I'll see laid out there for like, I mean, and my time frame is like, flexible if you guys are like whoa november <laughs> december january like whatever i'm i'm cool <laughs> i just don't want to ship something that's gonna be a pain um and i'm i'm just trying to keep myself accountable and get the ball over the line but yeah. if if i need to go slower that's not a problem at all i mean like oh. finding you know there's a difference between finding bugs versus we need to make sure the api is is set it's, it's and set so right. i think we can probably poke around enough to make sure that the API yeah. kind of works, and if there are bug fixes, we can we can take patch releases or minor releases for that. Perfect. Honestly, like because we still use vendor and everything, I think I'm um, like, I think the important thing here is just that we have a feedback loop with you, so we can collaborate. Um, I think like we're going to be pretty fine if we yeah. don't migrate right away. We have a lot of dependencies that are pretty old as long as they don't have like vulnerabilities or something we're not too worried yeah forget all the features that part you said about like hey i'm actually planning on being more responsive now i feel like it is our duty to you as a maintainer to make sure that we're giving you issues on the most up-to-date code base not some uh, ancient yeah. thing that you haven't touched uh, do, yeah and, and just on that like i'm once I ship v2, I'm I'm not spending many cycles on v1 just because the code base is so much better to work with you yeah. know how it is mm -hmm. um Okay, and then I guess my last thought is, if if I can be helpful, like I'm happy to like carve out a few hours and pair with someone, or just like, you know, just I'm happy to work together um, uh, on the on migration to V2, but also just in general, like if, if if it would be helpful to like look at what you all have already and like just poke at, is there a better way to use Ginkgo? Is there a better way to use Gomega here? Like just in general, I would be happy to do that if that would be valuable. I don't. Kubernetes is a huge project. That's a big sprawling question. I totally get it, but yeah. I just wanted to plant that seed in case y'all are interested. Uh, that sounds cool. I don't have any concrete idea right now, but yeah, let's keep that out there. For keep sure. it out there. That's right. That sounds cool. Cool. Um, uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, I think I talked to uh, talk to you before uh, about uh, uh, this is maybe uh, I'm work for Apple, and so yeah. we do use that uh, reporter and we use the customer reporter for uploading data to uh, databases, Prometheus databases or to other reporting systems. And my concern was if it will break us. Yeah, so it, you, it should not break you. Um, without getting too much in the weeds, uh, there's, there's a mechanism to take a V1 style reporter and just mm -hmm. a single line of code will integrate it into the new V2 world. So I've made that bridge really easy. Um, uh, and then once, once you've done that, you can take your time 
actually building out tooling that uses the new reporting infrastructure, and it will probably serve you better than what we currently have. So it really shouldn't break you, um, but that's yeah. a good example of something that if there's any way that you could just try it early and let me know if it uh -huh. works or doesn't work, that would be valuable. Um, okay, uh, if you will send me the, um, or remind me what the uh, br branch is gonna be. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Um, and I also, I, I think that it will be good for Vladimir to hear this because uh, if the uh, framework two version will use the, how they incorporate it with the new reporter as well. I think it, it, they use it, right? Um, sorry, say that again, I was taking notes. Does the framework uh, two use, uh, uses the reporter? Do they we, need any upgrade think, or anything? I think we have a custom reporter somewhere. So I yeah. am aiming it's, we'll have to make a change as well, but it's the, as far as I know, the reporter is not decoupled from the framework. It's basically, it's all in the same model of the code base. So we should be able to iterate that on that if Antonio hasn't already. And just, just one other quick thought on the reporting, like um, sort of like the inline programmatic reporting behavior is a bit different, but like I said, it's totally backward compatible. You can, I can even like translate an existing reporter over and it'll just work. But what's really cool is the new JSON output. Like it has absolutely everything. And there's now support for you can annotate tests with additional data and that'll end up in the JSON report. So you can do whatever you want. It's much more flexible. And I feel like here's my JSON file, go and post-process it is probably a much better interface than please integrate a library into my code while it's running to send stuff to your database. And so I think, again, phase one, everyone just get over to V2, but then as you all play with the new stuff, I think you're gonna find better solutions to existing problems than what you've had to do in the past. Well, I do need more details. Yeah, you'll have all the details. Every, <laughs> yeah, like every last little bit is now in that in that JSON format. All right, thanks. Uh, Thank you. That was my great. That was said with the tone of voice. Of careful what you ask for. <laughs> uh, it sounds great. I've uh, I've enjoyed seeing all the details uh, that I have. Great. Um, Cool. Uh, thanks so much for stopping by. Antonio, did you have anything else you wanted to discuss on this? No, I, as you say, we need to iterate. I, I need to, to check in. We are consuming this and I need to check in. in Red, at Red Hat, what, what are the implications? But... Okay. Uh, awesome. Thank you for bringing this. Uh, all right. Uh, Let's see, I still don't see Vladimir. Uh, I think I, I don't know what Vladimir's thing is, unfortunately. I know uh, Eddie's thing on the agenda is that Prow now has an issue transfer plugin um, and it is actively in use. I believe within the Kubernetes SIGs org, issues can only be transferred within an organization. Uh, and I am not clear on whether it gates to like certain privileges or rights or something, hopefully we can get Eddie to give us a walkthrough of this uh, later. But I definitely saw an announcement get sent out to Kubernetes dev uh, and Kubernetes SIG testing. Um, so super, that, that one's been standing out for a while. So it's really cool to see that finally implemented. Um, next up, I, Unless anybody has anything more pressing, I was going to walk through our board for a little bit and just check in on where we're at uh, or things we've committed to for this uh, release cycle. If I can type. Cool. Okay, this is the SIG testing project board. Um, it is issues only. Uh, we've got the help wanted column, which is filled with relevant things where if anybody wants to help out or willing to help uh, review or describe how to implement it. We've got a backlog, which I do not know if I actually sorted in priority order recently. It's kind of annoying to do that. Um, we've got our in progress column and we've got stuff that's blocked. And uh, one question I kind of 
had for the group is uh, around prioritization. Um, I kind of feel like as I just scroll through this board, uh, I see a lot of orange labels, um, lots of orange labels, uh, which are all the priority important soon or maybe priority important long-term uh, priorities. Uh, does anybody pay attention to these? Like, I'll tell you my problem as somebody who looks at this board maybe more frequently than you do. Um, in my head, I know there are a few specific issues that I really care about us getting done this release cycle. For example, I really do want to see us move the scalability jobs over to Kate's Infra and have Google stop paying for those. And I really want to get us over the line on uh, see, I can't even find the issue right now. Uh, migrating away from Google.com owned uh, container registries for images that are used as part of E2E tests. Like, I, I love every single image involved in the CI of Kubernetes, whether that be something that's used to build Kubernetes, to test Kubernetes, to run Kubernetes, to run the jobs that do all of this. I would like all of those to come from community infrastructure. So I have that in my head. But when I look at the board, it is not clear to me that that is the most important thing. Um, I don't know that anybody else here knows that other than I'm, I just said the words out loud. Uh, so uh, one thing I could do is start to put on priority critical urgent on uh, the issues that I feel like, no, we really, really have to get these done. Um, another thing I could do is start being more aggressive at kicking out anything that's nice to have we're leaving us with like just the absolutely critical set of stuff to do. But then I feel like that leaves less opportunity for people who want to get involved, but are maybe a little uh, not so sure about getting involved with something that is like high visibility and could potentially break things and so on and so forth. Um, does anybody have any thoughts or opinions on that? Uh in my opinion, uh, most of the things I mm, I've sent before, I have almost always uh, added the priority importance soon. I only made that because I don't think uh, those labels are mm, too fine grained or mm, useful. For example, if I have something done and it could easily merge soon or something like that, I would put that tag. So if we could find better tags to signal uh, how easy something is to merge or how ready it is, I think that would be a, a step in the right direction. Or at the very least have more levels, something like high or um, yeah. I don't know, easy to merge or something like that. Yeah, if you go read the contributor docs, which I don't have a, a handy link to right now, but there is something that describes sort of organization-wide what we feel like all the priority labels mean. Um, uh, as an aesthetic choice, the fact that priority important soon and important long-term are the same color uh, makes them basically indistinguishable for me, other than like maybe by length of the label, but it's pretty tough when they're that long already. Um, and important soon has basically become proxy for, are we planning to ship at this release, yes or no? Which is also answered by, is it in the milestone, yes or no? So I feel like that's kind of redundant information, but the way you describe using the priority labels, Claudio, is exactly how I've seen everybody else use them, and it's exactly how I use them. Uh, so I think I am proposing like stratifying a little more, uh, putting priority critical urgent on some more stuff and seeing if that helps us gain a little more visibility into like what we actually care about. Um, you know, another alternative is uh, I have experimented a little bit idly with triage party, but I don't feel like I have a good set of rules that really make it super obvious uh, what we should be doing and what our triage rules are. But um, I can set that up and we can start to go through sort of recurring triage party uh, things collectively. Uh, so we're all kind of on the same page about what to do. Okay, and I'm just looking at chat here. Arno says we should move, the, we should focus on the critical things and moving move everything else to Q1. All right, so 
uh, I'm super happy to do that. Um, I don't want to hold you all hostage for the next 10 minutes while I go through everything line by line. Um, I mean, that's a different the problem I always see with this is that there's a there's a there's a difference between this is what we think is important slash we're acknowledging this has this level of importance and this is what people are actually prepared to work on. I think milestones help flag like we're working on this like this milestone we expect to ship it, and the priority label is more like signaling to the community like we're aware that this is something that needs to happen soon versus, eh maybe later. But the, even if we're aware something it needs to happen soon, that doesn't mean that we have it staffed. Should we have help wanted? So the problem is help wanted has a very specific definition. That means that the issue needs to be scoped out such that like a beginner level to barely intermediate level contributor could start working on it. And the challenge is that many of these require a ton of knowledge on uh, exactly how everything is wired together. Uh, and many of these need to be done in a way so as not to break the community when we change things. Um, so uh, you're saying good first issue is good for first contributors. If I just go take a look real quick at one of the issues that's got help on it, we'll go, we'll go see what the bot says. And if it proves me wrong, I can dump everything in our backlog that we really need help on into help on it. But like everything in the help wanted section and stuff, we'd love people to help on. Um, I see people assigned to them, but it can be difficult to see whether or not that actually means that something is happening with it. Uh, last comment on this was back in August, for example. Um, so let's see. Low barrier to entry, clear task, Goldilocks priority, and up to date. Uh, so I can go through and regroom everything to make sure that uh, anything that meets these priority these criteria uh, is listed as help wanted. Um, this is not not super clear to me if that's going to be the best use of my time. So for example, I have filled, I think, a role of like a new contributor ambassador, somebody who is willing to help out a whole bunch. Um, however, thanks Antonio, good to see you. Uh, however, I'm kind of double booked these days trying to do the same thing for uh, Sig Kate's infra as well. Um, so it's not something I personally feel like I can dedicate my time to, but I would certainly love help and would be happy to share my contextual knowledge with somebody who wants to try taking this on. Okay. Let's advertise for that within the community. And I think let's just sort of follow up offline on uh, grooming stuff. Uh, I think SIG testing has been, uh, while I have you here, Ben, I had a question about um, one of the issues that's listed as in progress, which is that the US te test job should reflect trivially runnable local defaults. Mm -hmm. uh, my question was, what's left to do before we can call this done? Um, we could arguably close this one, I think, because we got the defaults-ish right. I was quibbling on they're not trivially runnable because they don't pass. Um, we fixed the don't pass without root part, but there's still something very strange going on with versions. Um, I'm not sure if we got that fixed yet. I haven't had time to follow up. That That one might also be fixed now. I've been manually going and like getting a clean environment and just like running make tests and seeing what happens. And it has been sad to see that so far, every time I have followed back up and tried that it doesn't pass. Is this a question of flaky tests? 
No, it's been things that were like it it worked or like it only works in CI or something like that. Or like it there were a number of unit tests that were requiring root. We have locked that out now. We don't run them as root. You can't do that in CI, but people would write unit tests for like say like some storage something and it wants to like interact with mounts or something like that that like a unit test shouldn't be doing. Um, some of the other ones are just more inexplicable. Like we're supposed to have in ver injected version metadata that things can depend on. And for some reason that seems to be fine in CI, but like locally it's not the case. So we're like unit tests are failing on that. There's been, there's just been like a steady stream of like, you can't actually clone Kubernetes and run the unit tests and just have them pass, which I would expect as a contributor, I feel like that's a pretty big red flag starting and tells you something about the state of the project. Part of it is just because there, it's it's too slow. There's just too many. So I don't I don't think many people are actually doing this, but I would think particularly a new contributor might do this and actually run like the whole suite. And right so far, the experience on that has been awful. It just doesn't work. And uh, previously, you needed to set you needed to set options to match what we were actually running. Like it was not the default. Some of that's fixed. I'm not sure if it's all fixed yet. Okay. Do you think that's something you can take a look at in the next two weeks? I think that's something I can look at today. I mean, really, I just need, we just need to like do another like clone from head and run make test and see what happens. Um, I think I think the last thing that I had found was fixed, but every time that that has happened, I've found that there's a new one. <laughs> I wanted to call attention to the two caps that we said we were going to do during this life cycle. So one is taking the kube test to CI migration to beta. Uh, I've added a comment at the bottom of the cap issue, which lays out all of the jobs that need to be migrated to kube test to and then all of the jobs that need like equivalents uh, for kube test two uh, runs. Uh, and we're also looking for a guide to help people migrate from kube test uh, to kube test two. Um, this stuff especially really needs to happen well before code freeze, in my opinion. So I think if we can see movement on this in the next like two to four weeks, I'll feel a lot more confident that we're actually going to be landing this in beta. Um, the other cap that we have is reducing Kubernetes build maintenance. Uh, this is effectively a no-op. Um, ben has done basically all of the work. The only thing that remains is to actually turn down and remove all of the older builds that still use Bazel, the older versions of Kubernetes. Essentially, we're just waiting for the versions of Kubernetes that use Bazel to age out, and then we can fully remove there's also some like related tech debt to clean up. Like for example, we still have code to make sure that you don't have Bazel build files in the repo. Um, at some point, it doesn't make sense to continue doing that. And we should expect PR reviewers to catch that. It's like, it's not a matter of like stale PRs or something anymore. Um, I think it is pretty reasonable to go ahead and call that once we no longer have any branches. Otherwise, I feel like we could leave it indefinitely. And they are kind of slow things to do. You know, we need to scan all the files, that sort of thing. There's also the question of, should we continue running the like enormous Bazel build cache? Uh, we allowed some other subprojects to use it, but if we're gonna continue to run it, I think we should at least scale it down um, because the majority of the load was the Kubernetes repo. And that's the reason we set it up to begin with. Um, I don't think the cost is justified once we no longer have any branches in Kubernetes using it. So we should at least make it smaller. So there's some infrastructure to turn down besides the CI jobs, or at least uh, uh, scale down. Okay. Um, well, I said I would use the rest of our time and that's what I did, uh, we're at. 11 o'clock Pacific. Um, thank you to everybody who stuck around. Uh, thank you all for your time. Did anybody have anything else before I close? All right.
Well, uh, thanks everybody for showing up. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful Tuesday and we'll see you all in two weeks. Happy Tuesday.